you'd be surprised what people would laugh at in terms of intelligence. So often in comedy, we see people like going the other way, like to make it more accessible to the lowest common denominator, which ironically is a smart term. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, you can play to the top of the room and yes, you will lose some people at the bottom. However, there's this effect when the smarter people are laughing at a joke and other people, they see like, I want to be a part of this. <laughs> and then they just start laughing. They kind of get why it's funny, even though they don't get it. Right. And so the top of the room would be the numerator. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Now, are you ready for the KO Comedy Podcast? Yeah. And now your host, give it up for Sammy Obey. Hey, everyone. How are we doing? Good. Ooh. Yes. Good. Thanks so much for joining. So we have an amazing program for you tonight. It's going to be an interview uh, with the great Daya Lakshmi Narayanan. I've known her since when I started comedy and I was always inspired by how smart she writes. And I always noticed that she was getting work from it. So I was like, I got to copy yeah. that. So I'm a hack. Um, <laughs> I'm a hack, but I'm the host. So everybody welcome my friend, Daya Lakshmi Narayanan. Woo! Yay! Thank you, thank you. Thanks for joining, Daya. Um, so just let, let's let's get right to it, so everybody knows how many letters in your last name. Sixteen. Sixteen, and you, uh, you there is a math word for that too, and that you know for uh, like a sixteen-sided shape. What is it? It uh, my it's because it's sixteen characters. I just call it my hexadecimal last name. Uh, <laughs> that's a smart joke right there uh and uh well that, thank you thank you because nobody laughed except for you so i appreciate the it was smart but not well liked like right, me but not, I, <laughs> no that is not true at all Daya. you are definitely well liked that's why we got 26 people in here and last time we only had 25 so <laughs> You have taken us up a notch. We're improving our game. Thank you for being here. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna. <laughs> I always gotta like ask technical questions. Sam, are we both spotlit? Because it looks like we're in floating mode right now. Uh, yes, you're both spotlit. Okay, cool, cool, cool. All right, sweet. So, uh, so Daya, thanks so much for joining. Uh, I always admire you. Have a very well thought out Zoom background. Um, because I remember I did shows with you like the, one of the first weekends we were doing Zoom and like you had like a nice layout of pillows and now you have like a different look. Is it like leopard or something? Uh, I, don't, I don't know exactly what animal this is, but it's, uh, it's, it's artificial material, uh, but it, it, I decided to change up the pillow game because I want to keep people yeah. on their toes or on their butts as we do on Zoom. <laughs> and it's all vegan, right? All vegan, no cheese. All vegan, harmed. no animals were harmed. Uh, so yeah, so th thank you for admiring the pillow and uh, background game. I, 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 have a, mathematical. I have a special glass for you. It's my Netflix glass, Sammy. So congratulations oh. on your show. Thank you. I have a regular <laughs> mug for you. Congratulations <laughs> on, uh, on drinking water. <laughs> See, that's how you know me and Daya are nerds. We both got cups of water at a comedy program. Um, so Daya, we met in, uh, I believe, 2008, which was essentially within my first year of comedy. We were doing the Rooster Tea Feathers comedy competition together. And uh, we were in the semifinal round together. I don't know if you remember any of this, but I'm recounting it either way. Go we ahead. Semifinal. We were in the semifinal <laughs> round together. And uh, I brought a lot of friends. I don't know if you brought people or not, but we both had good sets, but I had a good set because I brought a lot of friends. And uh, I went up in the middle, it went well. And then you went up at the end and just crushed it. And you closed <laughs> with this joke uh, about calculus. And I was just like, I, I, my mind was blown because I didn't know you could talk about calculus at a comedy show. Like I thought that was <laughs> forbidden, you know? Cause I grew up on like raunchy comedy and I was a math major and I was like, wow, I'm, I'm really making a career shift. Cause I was just like, I'll, I was just like humping stools at that point, you know? Uh, I mean, like I was doing them at like certain angles. Like I was using my math degree for like the velocity of it, but like, right, right. I didn't... To get, you need to get the fulcrum correct when you're humping exactly. the stool. It's the, 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 yeah. If you don't get that fulcrum right, you're falling on your ass and it just, and then the stool's fucking you. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, so yeah, you did a calculus joke at the end and I was just like, whoa, you can, you can talk about math and get laughs. And uh, little did you know, you opened up Pandora's box and now a lot of people hate me for it. But <laughs> I, I am working, I'm getting work thanks to you, Daya. So I just wanna say thank you for that. And uh, you inspired me very early on in my career. Thank you, Sammy. That's actually not how we met, but thank you for uh, creating that memory. <laughs> that was a beautiful memory. <laughs> how, how did we meet? We met, do we meet like a mic before that or something? I was at the punchline and you came up to me and you said, I heard you went to MIT. I'm a math major. And then I said, where did you go to school? And you said, Berkeley. And I said, I have to go get a drink now. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Sammy. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I think that's, I must have blocked it out of my memory because I got dogged so hard. Uh, no, no, no. That's that, actually we, we became writing partners very soon after yeah. that. So you, yeah, yeah, that was yeah, a good yeah. opening line. Definitely. Well, we did we did the comp. We did the comp, and then we started writing together after. Just because I, I remember the comp ended in like mid uh, two thousand and eight. We've got these new earbuds, and they're falling out. Uh, the comp ended in mid two thousand eight. I remember by the end of two thousand eight, we were we were writing together, and yeah. you always had great tag ideas. I remember like you gave me like one of the best tag ideas early on in my career that I later went on i won the the san jose improv competition off of that joke alone like that was the joke where the audience was like this guy's a genius and i'm like that's actually Dia's tag um, it, it's all you sammy i probably it yeah. couldn't have worked for me so i mean that's the great thing about having a writing partner you give people things that work for them that you don't necessarily want for yourself so it's Right. It's really give and take. And um, right. you gave me tags too. I was doing a joke about uh, public transit in the city and your tag for me was uh, nutsack of noon, taint of twilight. So I appreciate <laughs> your tags as well, Sammy. <laughs> See, I was such an evolved comedian at such an early age. Um, wow. Uh, uh, so, so, and, and I think this is that, you know, we're already at a great point here is that, you know, two minds uh, are better than one in most, you know, non-degenerate cases. Uh, and that's a great, I think that's a great writing tip because, you know, your, your friends, especially people who you have good chemistry with, or like know your material, they can see things that you don't and you can do the same for them. And so, you know, combined, you have this synergy effect, which can make your material smarter it's just like when you put people like in a group like a big group like they get smarter because isn't there some kind of like theory behind that you know what i'm saying sometimes when you uh, put like, people together they all think the same and it's called group yes. think and that's bad okay. that's not good that's but not good. sometimes not, not when one. you there's another one <laughs> some uh, gang bang is that is that what that was <laughs> yes yes the the nutsack of noon and the taint of time is the gang bang yeah taint of taint of uh, twilight Twilight. Twilight. Yeah. Twilight, yes. Uh, well, I, Twilight's kind of a smart word, so I guess I wasn't that bad. No, no, um, it was a good joke. It was a good joke. <laughs> so, okay, so, 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 yeah, so, so there is, I'm just going to be with my right ear today. So the, uh, <laughs> my left, my left ear fe fell out, but I still have my right ear. Right smarter. So anyways, um, <laughs> thank you, that was pretty bad. So, um, so, so yeah, so, okay, yeah, sometimes you put people together, they become dumber, but there is something, there is something about like a collective intelligence <clears throat> well, that I've noticed in comedy specifically, because people would often say this to me, they'd be like, your comedy's smart. And I'd just be like, well, I thought my comedy was like regular. I thought I was just doing like regular comedy. But like when, when, when you have a, when you tell a joke to one person who doesn't get the smart joke, it's like, you feel like an idiot. Like you feel like you wrote a bad joke, but then you tell it to a room and a bunch of people who get it laugh and then there's a lot of people who like they wouldn't have got it if those people weren't there but they see why those people appreciate it and it almost makes them smarter do you know what i'm saying have you ever like observed that effect in stand-up yeah so so there's a couple of things i think that um some comedians when they do smart material or material that that means something to them the expectation is that the audience rises to the occasion that you you're not dumbing it down they have to meet you so they have to do a little right, bit right. of effort to meet you to be able to understand the joke i do want to add though there is a component of gender because if you look up smart comedian it's norm mcdonald 
John Stewart, Stephen Colbert, um, Anthony Jeselnik. I think all of these people are really, really funny and very smart. Um, and if you're a woman, Michelle Wolf, Samantha B, Wanda Sykes, uh, and if you tell a smart joke, the expectation is you should not go over their heads because the audience won't be able to get it. So there is a component of gender, there is a component of race, but most of the time, if you can get the audience to meet you and do a little work for it, then they feel satisfied. They feel like they got something out of it um, that they m normally wouldn't have get if they, if they were spoon fed something. That's that's a great way of putting it. And another another way that um, you know you can say it is like playing to the top of their intelligence. Yeah. When you play to the top of the room intelligence room's intelligence, it actually like trickles down somehow to everybody else. Um, so so yeah, that's one thing to know. People like I was always surprised, and this is an example of like what I said about you earlier. I was always surprised early on in comedy about like things that I never would have, things that I would have thought would have been too smart for a comedy room actually get huge laughs. And of course it depends on where you are. Like, yes, you know, I'm talking about times when we were in the Silicon Valley where there's a lot of, you know, relatively smart people. We also performed at the punchline in San Francisco, like a lot of smart people there, but still like, uh, you'd be surprised what people would laugh at in terms of intelligence. I mean, same thing uh, other way around, like nutsack and, and, and taint. Like, you'd be surprised at what people think is funny. But like, it goes both ways. And just so often in comedy, we see people like going the other way, like the dumber way to make it more accessible to the lowest common denominator, which ironically is a smart term. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, but at we... the same time, you can play to the top of the room. And yes, you will lose people. You will lose some people at the bottom. However, there's this effect when people like I was saying earlier, when, when the smarter people are laughing at a joke and other people like they see why they appreciate, it, they laugh along. And there's all, also people who are like, I want to be a part of this. Ha 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 ha. And then they just start laughing. And then they it like kind of, they kind of get why it's funny, even though they don't get it. So everybody kind of becomes smarter. You know? Right. And so the top, I guess, would be the top of the room would be the numerator. So. Uh, That's right. That's right. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah. Play to the play to the to the numerator, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I I think the the reason if people do smart comedy or what they deem is smart comedy, we need to define that term because I think that the term is general. So we should define it for yes. the the fifteen people who are uh, slogging through this evening. Um, but <laughs> I think that uh, one of the interesting things about that is nobody wants to feel dumb. Nobody wants to feel mansplained or smart person splained to. No one wants to feel like they're an idiot and, and that people are looking down on them. What people want is that they want to feel like they're part of this group that's um, in group and that they feel lucky to be a part of this group and ah ha ha we're sharing a laugh this means we're all in this together and we have some like um you know pro social value to that so if you can inspire people to be part of your group and oh wow we all get this joke together we're in on it then that's inspirational and aspirational but if you put people down and make them feel like idiots then they're going to be resentful of you so it's that delicate balance of how to talk about things that you feel are important without alienating people. Absolutely. Yeah. And, 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 and so in, in a sense, it's kind of like playing smarter is always to your advantage. Um, and, and comedy, I mean, in, in, in a sense, comedy is inherently smart, right? Like to understand a joke, you have to use some sort of intelligence. So that's why people like it because they they have to they have to think like just at least a little bit to get it right. I think there's some instances, not to contradict the theme of this great session you put together, Sammy. There's some instances where writing smarter doesn't help. I've done a few weeks on cruise ships, and oh my God, did I have to throw away every single thing I wrote about race? politics, religion, <laughs> feminism. Uh, I mean, these people are like sunburnt, <laughs> drunk from the middle of America. They've never seen an Indian person before. They've gone to the buffet seven times. The last thing they want to do is think. They want aloe vera gel for their burnt skin. So they don't want what I have to offer them. So it doesn't help you to, to play smart sometimes.
Okay, yeah, I, 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 I totally agree. And I would say, like, I guess it depends how smart we're talking. Because, you know, uh, I, I was actually doing some cruises in the, in, in, the, in the last years, as they say, of comedy. And, uh, and I, I noticed the same thing. You can't, you can't go too highbrow with those cruise uh, crowds. However, um, they did appreciate, there, I mean, not, not everybody, but there was a lot of people who did appreciate some level of smarts, but you had, you couldn't let them know that you're too smart, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. If you show people that you're not that smart, if you'd be like, these, these specific crowds, just be like, hey, listen, I'm smarter than you but I'm aware of it. So I'm going to give you this level of smart. And they're like, I respect you for that. You know, because if you come out there like at your actual intelligence, they're like, who is the, what is this person? Are they from the future? This is a cruise, <laughs> We're still in, uh, you know, 1950. So yeah, but totally, totally understand what you're saying. And, uh, and that's, I mean, you know, not just cruises, clubs everywhere, right? Middle America, um, you know, bars, which we've done a ton of. Right. Well, I, I think I think one of the one of the important parts of that is when, when people think of, oh, wow, you know, we're, you're writing smart comedy or you wrote that joke about calculus or, or whatnot. Uh, by the way, Nutsack of Noon and Taint of Twilight is alliteration. So that's a valid literary <laughs> reference. So that is smart. Uh, so so um, I, I think when when you write smart comedy, what people notice is they notice the writing. However, it mm -hmm. takes mm -hmm. so much work as a performer to be able to sell that writing. You can't just get on stage and tell the smart joke. You have to have some nuance. You have to be able to, I mean, it's, uh, Vishal is on, on this call. And um, I think I, I, um, I said to him once when he asked me about this, hey, Vishal, uh, Vishal asked me the same question. <laughs> and I said, it's basically like seduction. You can't go in front of the audience and be like, here's my nutsack of noon. You have to be able to somehow seduce the audience to be able to get them to see your point of view. And that's what performance is. So you can't just be like, look what I got. I got a protractor in my pants. You have to lead them along. You have to give them some gentle kisses. You have to tell them they're pretty. And then you can get them... <laughs> to do what you want them to do. Wow, that's that that is that is that is very nice. Like seduction. I've never heard it like that. But uh 100% true. I never knew that I've seduced so many middle Americans. Um, <laughs> so 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 Daya, uh can I ask how long you've been doing comedy for at this point? Well, over a decade now. Well, yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> I <laughs> started after you. Greater than, less than, greater than. So you have to be at at least 13 years. Uh, pro yeah, I think we started around the same time. But yeah, probably like between 10 to 12, I thought. But, you know, okay. I'm not the math well, 13. person. No, we, we, we've definitely been around for 13 years. But it might be okay. like thir 13, 13, 13-ish, I guess. Okay. So uh, how often do you write? Yeah, th this is this is an interesting question because um, there when I when we first started, I think that there was this real um, uh, kind of urge to tell people what what kind of things that who they were based on how much they were writing. So there's this real sense of like you got to grind, you got to hustle, you got to kill, you got to murder, you got and it's it and now in retrospect all of that just feels so toxic and just masculine to me. I mean, I'm not look at me. I look like a sassy stewardess. I'm not masculine at all. Like that kind of terminology doesn't work for me. And so um, you know, the Venn diagram between comedians and athletes is is separated by kilometers. So we, we don't really have people who train their bodies who are comics, unless it's Joe Rogan. And please don't make me talk about him on this podcast. But, um, <laughs> but what I'm saying is when athletes train, rest day is really important for them. Or they cross train, or they do yoga, or they foam roll, or do something else besides the right, right, grind, hustle, do it. This is the way to do it. So I write something every day and I cross train. I'm either writing stories for the moth. I'm working on my writing gig that pays me money. I'm finishing my samples, my pilot, my screenplay. I'm writing jokes for the stage. 
Um, I'm, you know, do I'm doing something and then some days I rest. So I don't think that there's only one way to do it. And that one way is the societal specific way that unless you're doing it this way, you're not valid. And that that's not that's not real work. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, I would say amen, but God's a woman. That's what she said. All right. Um, so, so, I mean, that, that, that's so well put, like diversify your portfolio. You know, the best writer is one who can write in many forms and not to mention, it's like when the incentive for you to write more is there, you're going to write more. So what for me is incentivizing, and it sounds like the same for you is just like mixing it up. Like I get bored of doing the same thing every day. Like if you, if you had to, if somebody told me I had to write puns every day, I would hate puns. Right. But no, people tell me stop writing puns. So I just keep writing. More, you know? I, I, but, I have an example. Yeah. I, I had this friend a long time ago. Uh, I'm not going to say his name, but um, he, he had a boyfriend and he told me, he goes, Daya, my boyfriend and I are going to try to have sex every single day. And I was like, let me know how it goes. And then after three months, he goes, this was the worst experiment that I ever did in my life. We're going to discontinue the experiment because they thought that it was going to be fun. But at the end of that yeah. three month mark, they're like, why did we do this? This was dumb. We, this, this is taking all the joy out of it. Yeah. Right. That's uh, yeah. You, you have to keep it interesting for yourself because people will, will so often ask me, like, how often do you write? Like you have to, you make yourself write every day. Like, no, I make it interesting because if you live an interesting life, there's so much to write about every single day. You go to the store and the cashier says something to you that like, they're like, hey, do you wanna, can you help me bag? Like, <laughs> this is, yes, I do. This is a great joke. I work here now, you know? <laughs> like if, if, if you go through something traumatic, which everybody does every week, like write about it. Like there's so much, and that's the beautiful thing about comedy. You can transmute any painful experience into writing. So really like when you're using writing therapeutically, uh, there's no limit to how much you want to write for your own personal gain, if you will. There's um, no limit, but it can be derivative. Uh, yes, it can. It can. Yes. Very well said. I think, I, I think also um, writing is not just like being on the laptop or taking out a pen and writing in your notebook. Sometimes writing is reviewing the set that you recorded that you said that you were going to look at, but you just are too afraid to look at it. Sometimes writing is being able to look at other comics who you admire and watch their set and be inspired by it. Uh, sometimes writing is and write taking down a, their jokes. Yeah. <laughs> like you did to me. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> some, sometimes writing is really um, having a life outside of the grind, being able to spend time with people you love, being able to eat food that you like, have an experience in the world. Talk to someone at a bar that you've never talked to. Unless you have a rich life, you're writing about things that are so boring that you're not actually bringing any insight to the stage. And you can't do that just isolated, sitting in one place, just with your thoughts all the time. You have to have some kind of external stimulus or inputs to be able to make the output work. So, so that's why, like, you're hanging out with friends. They're like, "Wow, Di, you're so social." Like, no, you're just my external stimuli. <laughs> um, yeah, a, but, but, yeah, but actually, <laughs> actually, they are. Because I, I mean, right now, because I don't have access to a lot of open mics, I do call some of my friends. I was like, "Can I run this by you? I have a bit. Do you think this is funny?" And and you know, uh, and I have friends who aren't sick of me yet, but. But you, you kind of need to know how, how it lands with people and what people are thinking. I thought I was going to write this really brilliant joke about suicide. And one of my friends was like, bro, no, please don't do that. That's, that's terrible. So I was like, I'm so sorry. I, I won't, I won't do it. But, um, you know, maybe you I will. In the by me. Yeah, you should have <laughs> ran it by me. I would have, I would have been like, Daya, that's gold. Um, you know, every, everybody has their opinion of, of what's funny and what's not. That's why, like, you really, when you think about it, the more people you run your joke by, the smarter it gets because it picks up bits of collective intelligence. And if you can make it work for all of them, then it's the smartest version of that joke, right? Yeah. Or funniest, but or smartest or both. Right. 
Or sometimes it's like a lint roller. You're just picking up a bunch mm. of crap from everywhere. Yep. And at the end, yep. you're like, I got to throw this in the trash. So be careful yeah. who you <laughs> workshop your jokes with. <laughs> that does tend to happen. That doesn't. Now, I, I have a question. Can a smart joke be dumb? Of course. Of course. Some of the best smart jokes I came up with is because I have huge gaps in my intelligence. I don't understand certain things. <laughs> I'm, I'm dumb. Like I didn't like, uh, 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 so this was a few years ago. Um, someone was talking about BDE and I was like, what the hell is BDE? What does this mean? Like I was very curious about it. And, uh, then I did a Google search because I'm a nerd. And the first thing that comes up is Pete Davidson from Saturday Night Live. I'm like, why is he the epitome of BDE? And so th from this place of ignorance, I started writing, uh, but by the way, you can't spell Sammy obeyed without BDE either. So, you know, uh, so, so <laughs> yes, uh, I'll take that. Yeah, write it down. Uh, so, so <laughs> it came from a place of really being curious and not understanding and wanting to understand what the social sociological phenomenon was. And it turned into a joke. I think, uh, I don't set out to be like, I want to write a smart joke because I want to show people how intelligent I am. I'm really genuinely curious about the world and I'm curious about things that I don't quite understand. Or the other aspect of it is these are things that I love. I love math and science. I love talking about politics. It makes me happy to solve an equation. That's that's why, you know, very few people um, can, you know, tell me that, that those are boring things. For some people, it's sports, and I find that really boring. But for me, it, it comes from a place of love and curiosity. And that's how sometimes I'm really dumb, and I figure out what this means to me in the world. That, that, so many so many uh, points in there that I, that I want to like talk about, because like you make the great point that intelligence is relative, because if you're, you know, I'm not smart about sports, so I'm I'm dumb in sports. But you know, I have friends who can talk sports all day, all day. They're intelligent in sports, and somebody could write an intelligent sports joke that I'm not capable of writing. But you know, I can write a math joke. You know, um, by the way, my last name obeyed. It actually stands. For, it's an acronym for uh, Oh Big Energy Internal Deficit. Um, <laughs> so, so, so. <laughs> There's definitely many forms of intelligence and, and really, yeah, there, like there's no such thing as there's, there's obviously stereotypical smart, like you're a nerd, you're book smart, whatever, but uh, there's so many forms of intelligence. And so really writing smart comedy is just uh, a joke that caters to that specific kind of intelligence, right? It's just, uh, you know, it's not sexy. When people think they're smarter than you, it's not sexy. Absolutely, absolutely, because that's talking down to people. Nobody wants to be talked down to. And that's why a smart joke can make people think and make people be like, oh, I thought about what you said. Um, you know, and so there, I, I don't ever want to make people feel like they've come to a show and they, they, they leave feeling worse about themselves when they, than when they came in. I mean, we, our audiences have gone through such difficulty. They've, they've gotten a babysitter, they've paid for parking. Uh, maybe they're going through some loss in their family. So you don't want them to leave the show that day feeling terrible about themselves. You want to inspire them to, to make them feel good. And so that, that's exactly the, the, the role that smart comedy can play to be is to enlighten, to engage rather than to put down or to pass someone aside. Unless they're a heckler, then you want them to leave and feel really icky. Uh, definitely, definitely ruin the heckler's day. Um, and, and yes, so, 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 so that, that really does answer the question. Can a smart joke be dumb? Yes, because intelligence is relative. And also, I will say, I did a show once where I told all really smart jokes and this guy came up and he was like, man, you stupid funny. So I was like, hell yeah. So <laughs> smart jokes can be stupid. Um, so, uh, so Daya, like, let's say, uh, you know, new comedians out there, oh, by the way, we're going to do Q and A at the end and we're going to do the open mic that we're going to do Q and A at the end. If you have any questions, think about what you'd like to ask Daya. Uh, but what, what advice would you give to aspiring writers or new writers just in general, you know, other than what you've already said? Yeah. You know, uh, 
advice is is really difficult because I've been given so much bad advice in my career, and I'm so glad I didn't take it. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I I think that uh, the only advice that I can give anyone who's interested in in pursuing this artistic realm of being a writer or being a performer is find out what is essential to who you are as a human being and find a way to bring that energy and that perspective to the stage because um, your perspective is unique. You are valuable. You are, there's never going to be someone who like, who's just like you. So some people call that finding your voice, but it's really finding that thing about yourself that's weird, that's exceptional, that's strange, that made you feel not cool in high school and that made you feel distant from other people. Use that and bring that to everything that you're doing. Because, you know, once I started just owning who I was without any shame or any veneer of please like me, then my writing got better and better and better. And I started getting... Uh, booked for for lots of things and um, I was in a writer's room during this pandemic and um, Ronnie Chang from The Daily Show uh, introduced me and he was like you know these these comics are some of the best writers I know who aren't white and so <laughs> I think also mm -hmm. I mean it's an advantage you know for me to to be able to write for a, uh, you know an Asian person that other people maybe don't have so Whatever makes you who you are, you have to find a way to share that with people um, and and just forget about the fact that some people may not like you for it because you will eventually find those people who do like you for who you are. That's so amazing. And that's like that that sums up literally how I feel about my own personal evolution in comedy and probably a lot of other people's too. Like you learn how to become yourself and in the beginning, you see glimpses of it. Like there's a moment on stage where you tell a joke that you really liked and, and the audience vibes well with it. It's not hacky or anything. And you're like, wow, that was a real reflection of me and they like it. But then you go back to your shell and you start humping the stool again. <laughs> but then at some point you get so comfortable. So you learn to become yourself and you just, and you become yourself all day from the, you know, the taint of twilight to the nutsack of noon. So. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I wanted to add I wanted to add one thing. Um, very er, you know very early on, like you, you know you you may not get booked being yourself. You may not get opportunities. People will be like, oh, your jokes aren't landing or you're not funny. But eventually, you will meet the people that admire you, both in terms of audience and both in terms of other comics. Um, for the last five years, I've worked with Greg Proops on New Year's Eve, and this year he reached out to me and he said, Diet wouldn't be the same without you to do a show on New Year's Eve. I really want you to be a part of the show. And Proops has a podcast called The Smartest Man in the World. So literally, the smartest man in the world is asking me to perform with him, and uh, and it's such a great feeling. One time I walked into the green room and he was talking to his wife, Jennifer, and they were talking about a bit I had just done on stage, and Proops was falling out laughing and it's such a good feeling when someone that you admire their comedy or you respect them is telling you that you're funny it's like it's like oh my god i'm pretty oh yay <laughs> so so it's um so you will find those people but you know before that i worked with lots and lots of people who w wouldn't talk to me or who i felt marginalized or they didn't uh, want to interact with me in whatever way because they they thought i was weird or they thought i was um you know uh nerdy or that i uh my material wasn't the kind of material that they liked but it takes time but you have to persevere through that point where people don't like your writing or like your jokes you will find those people who like you Amazing. Amazing. So, uh, you know, I, I know you probably don't want to toot your own horn, but I want to, you know, let everybody know that you, uh, you, you work a lot. You've gotten a lot of great gigs and like different kinds of gigs that other comedians don't normally get for really smart organizations. You hooked me up with a science gig earlier this year or last year, I mean, and uh, like, there's all sorts of things you do that I would have never even thought like comedians could like reach out to these people. And I know we don't want to like 
go through everything and list it. We don't want these comedians to get these gigs. But uh, <laughs> but do tell us a little bit about like were you aware that you were kind of like playing that game in the sense of that like you knew that you were going to attract these people by being yourself and being smart or did it just kind of like fall into place and you realize at some point like wow i'm doing all these non-traditional stand-up gigs uh i mean the answer to that is that there's there's stand-up has changed so much that there's no such thing as a traditional stand like what we're doing right now is not a traditional stand-up gig it's this is completely so weird <laughs> and you and you created this platform sammy like this is this is something completely I built different. Zoom. That's correct. I founded Zoom, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and and Al Gore helped you by founding the internet. So your <laughs> your did, teaming yeah. up has really oh, created boy. something great. Um, <laughs> there's no such thing as a traditional. I mean, there's alt comedy, there's club comedy, there's theater comedy, there's comedy on television, there's people who do private events, there's people who are sitcom writers, late night writers. There, there's really no standard way of being a comedian in the world. There's improv comedians, there's sketch comedians. So, so you are limiting your universe by saying comedy must occur in this one specific way because you're putting those limitations on what the art form is yourself. And sure, there's people who tell you this is how it is or this is what comedy is or this is... I mean, I, I play clubs, I do theaters, I do private gigs. I, I, I try to do all, all of them because there's something... I'm a competitive person and I like challenge. I mean, not competitive with other people, but for myself, I like to constantly challenge. That's why I did the cruise. I wanted to see if I could somehow make those people laugh. So, you know, for me, it wasn't necessarily um, I'm going to do something non-traditional. It was that um, I had spent so much of my high school uh, trying to accommodate uh, being a smart person and being a woman with opinions and being a woman who liked math, who liked science. And I was constantly trying to accommodate other people to make them feel better because I didn't want to be too much. I didn't want to be too much of a nerd or too smart. And um, that 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 quickly changed because I was like, life is too short to hide who you are. And so I just kept doing me. And then people came to me and said, would you join this writer's room? Will you perform with me on New Year's? Um, you know, can you help us with this? And I would just, you know, say yes and take things on. And so it's it's really that I started to attract the people who saw in me what I saw in myself. Amazing, amazing. And 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 the point that that I've told a lot of people like who are starting out, like say yes to everything. I mean, as long as you feel comfortable doing it and you think you'll grow from it, in you know, in terms of gigs, if it's like it doesn't pay much or it's it's like a crowd that you wouldn't really want to do normally. Like just say yes to everything because you grow, you do you do all sorts of weird stuff, and you end up getting comfortable in all sorts of non non traditional situations like this Zoom call. That's why you're killing it. <laughs> I, I, Sammy, I, I told you, I, 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 I told you about this before um, we got on Zoom, but one of the best gigs that I ever did was um, at San Quentin. It's a maximum security prison. It's a death penalty prison. Uh, I performed for all men. Uh, there was, uh, there was uh, on the on the watchtower. There were men with guns pointed down at me, and I had to sign a release that said, "If there's a prison riot, we can't come and save you." Uh, so I took that gig on as a challenge, and and I didn't dumb down my jokes at all. And uh, at the end, one of the prisoners said to me, um, "Do you write your own material?" And another prisoner goes, of course she does. She's not Carlos Mencia. So these murderers <laughs> even knew that Carlos Mencia was a joke thief. And so that's the level of intelligence these men on the inside had. So I had no reason to dumb down who I was because they were smart. Wow, isn't that crazy? It, it just That just shows you how low on the totem pole stealing other people's jokes is. That even real thieves are like, fucking hack yeah. um, <laughs> amazing that and that what an awesome gig i wish we had the tapes from that but uh that just goes to show if you're smart you can you can play anywhere because you know whether or not your comedy is considered smart comedy 
it takes intelligence to be able to play to a variety of crowds. And, uh, and that's why we're here on Zoom doing it. So uh, thank you, Daya. I mean, anything else to add to that before we go into the next section? I didn't even know there was a next section. There's a next <laughs> section, Daya. <laughs> oh, part two of three. The, the part that everybody, every comedian here has been waiting for, um, aside from these great tips we've been giving. So uh, here's how it's going to work. We're going to do a raffle for the comedians. We've picked five comedians randomly from those who have signed up. You will do about two minutes. Uh, I guess we'll tell you, uh, Sam, we, we do something if they go over, right? Yeah. Yeah, I can shut them. Yeah. Okay, cool. So you got two minutes. Do a bit, do do whatever it takes two minutes, and me and Daya are going to talk about it. <laughs> we're Wait, gonna, we, we, we give, so we Sammy, what are we supposed feedback. to do? Be construct, constructive feedback or like okay. what we liked. Okay, okay. Yeah. Unless you want to do good cop, bad cop. <laughs> Just kidding. We give them constructive feedback. All right. First comic coming to the stage, everybody welcome, Lindsay Loon. Woo! Got to unmute. You're on mute. Unmute. <laughs> there you go. We can can you guys hear me now? Yay. Yes. Yay. Okay. I'm still Lindsay Loon. Um, so it's crazy out there. I've told so many people to be safe. It sounds like I'm obsessed with getting people to wear condoms. <laughs> <laughs> be safe be safe i'm like a crazed high school health teacher just running after the kids with condoms like <laughs> here take this one it's flavored it's not bad <laughs> don't ask me how i know <laughs> so, i'm jewish and half hillbilly <laughs> <laughs> i'm a jew billy <laughs> my father's family is from the mountains of north carolina and my mother's is from 5,781 years of Jewish suffering. <laughs> <laughs> We've got Jewish accountants who will do your taxes and hillbillies who will do your taxidermy. <laughs> <laughs> I take my matzo balls bacon wrapped. <laughs> and um, my grandmother's entire family was murdered in the Holocaust. Oh. Always a fun conversation starter. But I hate when people casually use Nazi as a descriptor, like, oh my God, I'm such a Nazi about cleaning the bathroom. Are you? When you clean the bathroom, do you steal human teeth? Mm. What's happening in there? Like, don't combine genocide and shower gel. <laughs> <laughs> I, know I, I know I sound fussy, but you know, when it comes to metaphors, I'm kind of a Nazi. <laughs> That's it for me. All right, Lindsay, great job. Everybody give it up for Lindsay. So many, so many great angles in there. Uh, I like, I like the be safe, you know, everybody's saying that now the condoms is a great analogy. It's a great bit. Um, you know, people are always saying that even before the pandemic, people would say be safe. And it's like, what do you, what, do I, do I look that wild to you? You know, like I never knew how to took that advice. Um, <laughs> But now people tell you to be safe. It's like be safe just means like don't like go and like give other people mouth to mouth. <laughs> yeah. Don't go outside. But uh, the Jewish hillbilly thing that you know that's a great angle. It's always you know fun to have a mix of two very different cultures. So you got you got a lot of great angles there. Really cool. And and the Nazi, the Nazi. But I think you know I, I do like to tell people if I've heard something like similar to that before. I think I've heard a similar angle on the Nazi thing. Okay. But I you know the. Genocide and shower gel, that's funny. You know, that's yours. That's all yours. So <laughs> so that's uh, very good stuff. Di, you got anything to say? I, I think Sammy said angle so much that now it's a full circle. Uh, mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lindsay, what I really liked about what you did is you just got right into it because um, a friend of mine used to say that stand-up is like being a trial attorney that the audience makes up their mind about you very quickly so you just got up there and you started with your first joke and then you continued and went and went and you didn't waste any time and um that takes a lot of confidence and so i really appreciate even though we can't really see all of it on zoom your stage presence and how you um owned that these are my jokes and i'm telling them that'll be a real asset for you thank you 
Although my first yeah, joke that... was like being muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> That's always a strong one. That's and you know what? That one. that happens at a club too. Sometimes your first joke, they're ordering drinks or they're talking to the table, you know, and right. they, they're not paying attention. And then you kind of have to, you know, uh, get get into it and then they start paying attention. So that just, that armor just feels like it, it it's on you now if you've been doing it for a while. So armor up, everybody, just like a flavored condom. Um, <laughs> great, Lindsay, great job, loved it. Uh, next comedian moving on, our next comedian, everybody welcome, Jen Perez. All right, thank you so much. Uh, I was trying to figure out which two jokes. All right, here we go. Um, I'm divorced. Uh, it's actually a bad story. Uh, my ex-husband looks like a cross between the Keebler elf and uh, Dexter from Dexter's Laboratory. Um, <laughs> basically, I married a leprechaun for a green card and he just took it and divorced me. Um, every time we had to go to the immigration office, I had to, to the immigration office, I had to explain to the officer, say, hey, listen, listen, the, uh, the lucky charm next to me, he's the immigrant. I was born in Jersey. Uh, it's called reverse immigration. Um, there was no pot of gold at the end of that marriage. Uh, you know, uh, my, my grandparents are Cuban, and uh, I recently found out that uh, the tooth fairy in Spanish is el ratoncito Perez, which translates to Perez the rat. <laughs> that means I have the most basic last name. The tooth fairy has the same last name as me. And like, why does my culture have to be so serious with the, with the tooth fairy? Like, why does it even have a last name? You know, what's interesting is on my 10th birthday, uh, you know, my, my great aunt, she gave me a gold bracelet with my own baby teeth as charms. That's when I found out that El Ratocito Perez does not exist. <sighs> How does this happen to me? How does this happen to me? My uncle has eight fingers and two girlfriends. <laughs> he has to leave his fingers in Cuba. He's slow. We call him Tortuga, it means turtle. My grandma still cuts a steak for him. How is he in a polyamorous relationship? He can't even spell polyamorous. How does he have two people and I have none? How, how? Uh, I'll end with this. Uh, my, grandma's, my grandma always says this to me. She always used to say this to me in Spanish. Ojo, que papá Dios te está mirando. Which means, watch out for that priest! I'm Jen Perez, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Jen. So, so, so many angles, so many angles in there. Uh, that story about your ex, I mean, that's such a great uh, mind for material. I mean, the fact that he was, he was Irish, you said, right? Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah and, and just, just, you know, the situation of, you know, for whatever reason, you, you know, if you come across ICE or whoever, like, who are they, who are they going to think is the immigrant? Like, that's a great setup for a bit right there, you know? Yeah. And the fact you know so, so i i i mean i saw what you were doing but i i think you you'll get it like it, it's okay. gonna take some like reworking but it's such a strong such a strong joke so keep keep going with that one okay and uh yeah the, definitely got to throw the pot of gold in there like you know <laughs> you know like yeah so i you know, i divorced you know i was married to a leprechaun uh, you know he married me for immigration to the bot you know what's the end of the rainbow a green card you know something like ah, that okay. yeah, yeah there's just, just you, you, you you'll you'll figure it out but like i'm just saying i i really saw what you're doing there and and yeah, it's great. You gotta you gotta keep going with that one for sure. And uh, I wasn't like sure if I believed. I, I didn't know if like if your uncle actually did. Uh, he's missing two fingers, and he yeah, and he has. Yeah, I have an uncle two. that's missing two fingers. Oh. Okay. Okay. Great. I'm not kidding. Yeah. So so or, no. I said sorry. I said great. Yeah. Great. That's such a great thing. No. Uh, but but like I think maybe you know I know you only had two minutes, but like I didn't believe it at first. So okay. You said I have an uncle who has uh, he's missing two fingers but he has two girlfriends and like that's funny but I didn't it just sounded like a joke so oh. like I would I would buy it more if you if you started with like you know hey my uncle is missing two fingers and we would all like whoa and then they make and get this he has two girlfriends what okay and then you know the whole thing about polyamory is so funny and I was just thinking of a, ta a possible tag it's like I wonder how many girlfriends he's going to have well I guess he can't go over 8 <laughs> 
<laughs> um, you know, something like that. But yeah, okay. that was really good. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Sammy did the math wrong on that. If you have eight fingers, I think you can have four girlfriends. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I think, um, Jen, I like your use of, um, your, your, you brought your bilingual aspect to it. Yeah, I think yeah. that's really great. Um, like back in the day, you know, George Lopez would do these gigs where he would just like speak Spanish and it was, um, it, it, ma it made the audience feel um, spoken to and, and really understood. So I like that you brought that in. Um, I had a question about the Keebler elf. Was was he? Did he bake you cookies, or was he just tiny? No, oh, it's a it's like a Spanish reference. So for like a Spanish kind of Puerto Rican Cuban reference. So every grandma she keeps her rice in a, a tin of Keebler elf. Oh, kind of like the, those cookies that you keep your sewing kit in. It's crackers. It's literally saltine crackers. That's what's supposed to be in the tin, but it's a thing of rice. Oh, okay. I didn't. I didn't get that cultural reference. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 very like very specific. I know. I, and then I also I felt because he was an elf and it kind of looked like a leprechaun. I thought it'd be funny. Yeah. To add it, but I get it. Yeah. No, I think I think all those work. I think those are those are all great descriptors <laughs> instead of just saying he was a short Irish guy. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Awesome. Great job, Jen. Thank you, Thank you one Thank more you. time. Next comedian coming to the stage, Chandru. Oh, hi. What is up, everyone? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Can you guys see Yeah. Sorry about that. I had people at my house. I'm still getting used to this whole uh, thing about it. I'm still getting used to this whole life about being in the pandemic. Um, like basically, you know, I was on, um, I was doing, I work in education. I was working on Zoom. I don't know if you guys have heard about that. Um, but, but yeah, uh, but basically with the, uh, so basically what happened is, you know, um, I feel that Zoom really highlights my um uh, basically my idiosyncrasies it's sort of just uh and uh, just sort of my neuroticisms <laughs> like, uh, like i am the kind of person who will fixate on the most uh, random uh, the most random things like i was trying you know i was uh working with the student i thought we were making some great progress but then this guy decided to sit in the kitchen and the microwave which is flashing like please press start and i was like i can't start anything right now i can't start teaching you until you just turn off until you just turn off this microphone. It just doesn't make. Uh, it, it just doesn't make. It, it, it just cannot focus on that. So I feel like. Um, so, so I feel like this whole. And that's one of the ways that my neuroticism has really uh, been. I think uh, really been highlighted here. And and another way I would say too. I, I think another way sort of that um, <laughs> that the pandemic is really <laughs> you don't have to improvise anymore. Like I remember like before when I used to like. It just being outside, like I feel like you have to really improvise things, um, like even just like walking down the street, like you know, how do you like move around people? Do you turn left or you turn right? Like I'm the kind of person who would try to move left or right, but then um, I would just uh, sort of my half top of my body would move to the left, bottom half moves to the right, and I'd kind of look like that snake game that you play on Nokia phones. And since I don't go anywhere, I don't have to do that anymore. Um, uh, so, uh, so that's what that's one of the ways too. That's one of the things that feel like we you know we need more pandemics so you can just sort of reset and stop improvising things. Um, and uh, and you know I did I wanted to say that because like I actually didn't realize that this is what that whole Google Doc was for. So I just put my name in because it's like oh, maybe I'll get a free <laughs> pair of sunglasses. Normally I'm much more hilarious in real life. <laughs> <laughs> and, this is, and that's pretty much all I have. I hope this is okay. <laughs> yeah, Chandru, good job. Thank you. Uh, you are, yeah, you are, you are quite a character. I like it. <laughs> Definitely uh, have you. a very care, yeah, character -y vibe. And and you know, you got us laughing. You were talking about your idiosyncrasies. We're like, yeah, we see that shit. <laughs> that was, <laughs> uh, thank you. I wish you I could are be normal you. to this. Like, yeah, I want to be like, oh yeah, I like the Big Bang Theory, being a normal person. But no, I'm not a normal person. No, no, this is better. Big Bang Theory, in my opinion, not funny. You are funny. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so I, I like it. I like I like your whole thing. And uh, yeah, I mean, you're just talking about what's going on. Are you? Are so you're 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 a, a, a distance teacher? 
Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, we're fully virtual, which is great because, you know, um, I really don't like, uh, you know, people seeing me. So it's really great. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny right there. See, are you are you shoehorning jokes into this conversation or are you just Uh, talking? See, that's. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm I'm trying to just like how drug dealers like, you know, like or or like what is I'm reading this book about sales and they're like, you should always be selling. So I'm trying to sell something. If you want, like, (laughs) jokes, uh, come find me after hours. (laughs) So it's funny that a teacher is reading a book about how to be a drug dealer. Great. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> great, it's a really great. bad book, but yes, uh, that is, uh, yeah, it, it's got, it's got every. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's bad, but I recommend it to all my students. Uh, <laughs> great. That's awesome. No, super funny, man. I, 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 you know, first time meeting you and uh, yeah, you're very, very, very funny. You, you have I a think it's the second time now. meeting you, by the way, first time you're meeting me. Well, you know, it's, you know, distance meeting is really, it only goes, it goes one way sometimes. Sorry, where, yeah. where did we meet? We met where at we the, meet? Uh, we met at Rooster Teeth Feathers um, at this, uh, okay. in 2019. Yeah, but like, okay. then again, 20, that, I don't, I don't, yeah, that, that year was, doesn't it, exist to me anymore. Exactly, <laughs> like, I mean, yeah, it, it was a uh, BC before Corona. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, well. Uh, sorry, I'm glad, you know, good to, good to meet you again. Back to, maybe we'll be at Roosters in a few months. <laughs> yeah, I hope so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Uh, Chandru, I don't know if I was laughing at your jokes or just laughing because you're so weird and it's awesome. <laughs> you are you are a hundred percent neuroses. I love that you're examining all your neuroses. You could be the Larry David of uh, Sunnyvale or wh- wherever you are. Where are you, San Jose, Sunnyvale? Yeah, basically that area. You know, for I could be the Larry David of four hundred eight. Okay, you're, you, you, you work on that because I think the aspiration is that you uncover these neuroses about yourself that are so weird that you might be able to make uh, some comedy out of it. So I, I appreciate that you're very much yourself. Thank you. Yeah. All right, one more time for Chandra, everybody. And moving right along, next comic, Vishal Kal. <laughs> Oh, hey, hey, it's me. Hey, good to see you guys. Uh, yeah, all right, I'll do a set. Uh, my name is Vishal Kalina Sundaram, long Indian last name. Uh, it's interesting, you know, have a long last name. Yeah, thank you, you know. Uh, like la- like many of you, last year I went to a George Floyd protest, you know, it was beautiful. I had a great time. Uh, but then they got to the part where they started ch- changing his name. And I was like, whoa, cool. They cannot do that for me, though. <laughs> Nobody's rallying for Kalyana Sundaram. That's a terrible rally, right? They'd be like, say his name. No. (laughs) Say his name. How? Very weird. Very bad. (laughs) Um, Oh, uh, I love uh, women. Shout out to women. Uh, I know it's a weird way to intro a joke, but um, I especially love like the cute voice that women use when they talk to, when you guys talk to dogs and stuff, you're like, oh, I think that makes everything better. I think women need to use that voice more in uncomfortable situations to make them better. Like in bed, I just want a chick to be like, aw, your little dick doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Does somebody have a widow erectile dysfunction? <laughs> Come here, boy, you get a little tweet. It's a Viagra. All right, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I also noticed uh, in bed, I'm, uh, am I out of time? Oh, no, sorry. I thought that was your class. All right, that's my closer. All right, thanks, guys. No! <laughs> I, I didn't want to cut you off. Was that, I didn't even know. Was that two minutes? I don't know. Uh, I had a great time, though. Thanks. Well, this, this is the first time someone with erectile dysfunction has finished so early. Uh, Vishal, you... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Dai, you want to you go? Say no, that. go ahead, Sammy. Sorry. Uh, yeah, Vishal. I met, I met, I met Vishal uh, like two weeks ago. We did a show together. Yeah, um, outdoors, and uh, I wanted to. I did what I, you know, I told you afterwards. You had a great set. I, I want to say I really I like that joke about your name, and uh, the protest because you're like, yeah, there will never be a protest. In my name. That's so funny, man. Like yeah. that's a, such a creative idea that I never would have thought of. Um, and uh, yeah, man, it's just it's a uh, you, you have you have you have a you've been doing comedy for a little while now. You have uh, you have great bits, great material, great stage presence. I noticed that when I was watching you. See, you know, I'm biased because this is not my first time seeing you. I've seen you uh, on stage yeah. in front of a real crowd. 
And uh, yeah, I this mean, is after you, I had you, you the took, worst bomb of my life too. <laughs> you told me about that. I, I didn't. I didn't catch that one. So you know, obviously yeah. the higher powers didn't want me to see that. Yeah. So I saw. <laughs> I saw the best. I saw the best. I mean, it was a great set that I saw. And uh, yeah, the joke about your name's great. I love jokes about names. You know, Daya does stuff about hers. I do stuff about mine. Uh, mine's a little shorter than both of y'all's, but you know. Uh, um, yeah, you're, you're finding for material in the right place. Um, and you know, I, I have heard like you like that, like that voice mm -hmm. I've heard, like takes on that, but you have a funny, uh, funny punchlines for it. So it's good stuff. It's original. Uh, yeah, Vishal, I've also seen you perform. So it's, it's, um, it's hard to kind of be objective. Um, one of the things that I like about your performance is how, um, approachable you are, how you're um, so open hearted and you uh, really invite the audience into your personal life, whether it's, you know, dealing with, you know, difficulties dating or um, your, you know, your your family or whatnot. And I and I think that there's so much um, interesting stuff that, uh, you know, maybe you've told me or I know about you that uh, I would really urge you to look at because um, there's there's more there and i see it and i want i want to know more and i would encourage you to start exploring that even if it feels difficult or scary cool thank you both so much thank you and next time bust out the guitar don't just tease us with it <laughs> <laughs> i'm just kidding you don't have to that's not your thing all right final comedian of the night everybody sereni <laughs> Yeah. Um, I, my girlfriend and I, we've been gaining a lot of weight during this pandemic. <laughs> so, uh, I feel like from the right angle, we just look like two pregnant women supporting each other. <laughs> <laughs> my girlfriend, she has beautiful hair past her butt, but it's really, she just, she sheds like a husky going through chemo. Okay. <laughs> there is hair everywhere. You drop your last nug on the floor and now you're smoking weed with hair in it and it's, it burns and it smells weird, you know? So that's been frustrating. I also, I feel like a six with a vaccine <laughs> is like a lot hotter than a nine, like a solid nine. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you're a five, like I'll take my chances, you know? And I found out that people who are getting the vaccine are mostly uh, people with pre-existing conditions and uh, what's it called, um, uh, essential workers, you know what I mean? So I feel like I'm noticing I'm, I'm really attracted to a lot of asthmatic chefs, <laughs> a, lot of, uh, a lot of diabetic paramedics, you know? <laughs> um, let's see, I, uh, I, I'm not I'm not someone who's very in tune with my culture, you know, I'm, I'm from Sri Lanka and I, I have this crazy, you know, irrational fear that I'm going to be wearing a sari walking down the street and some white woman's going to come up to me and be like, you're appropriating that culture. <laughs> and I'm going to be like, honestly, yeah, you're right. This does feel like a costume, you know. I thought that one would get something. No, <laughs> trying to figure that one out, you know? I just, yeah, I feel like when I wear my culture, it is as a costume. Um, but I, I don't believe in God, but sometimes I do uh, when I get a pimple in between my eyebrows and it looks like a bindi. You know, it's just like, oh, you don't know your culture? Like, I'll learn it for you, okay? Um, I think la last thing uh, I'll say is, you ever think about how you were probably conceived without your mom coming? <laughs> you think about that? <laughs> you know what I mean? You, like, you're like, yeah, I seen my dad build a table. He's not that good with his hands. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'll outsource this to somebody on TaskRabbit, you know? <laughs> okay, that's all I got. Thank you so much. All right, Sereni, everybody, such good stuff. You know, I'm always a fan. Um, you, you know, I've watched you over the years too, and like you're, you're so good with language. You know, asthmatic chefs, diabetic paramedics, husky and chemo. Those are great. Those are great tidbits of language right there. I love it. Uh, I was thinking for your, your vaccine joke, which is amazing. It's great. Uh, uh, Fi you're a Pfizer five. <laughs> oh, that's good. Hell yeah. yeah. I couldn't, yeah, unfortunately that doesn't work for any of the other ones or a modern, there's no uh, M or J and yeah. J letters, mm -hmm. but yeah, Pfizer five, I think is something. 
Beautiful. But uh, yeah, that vaccine's great. So, so good. Thank you. Daya? Yeah, I, uh, Sereni, I like how you, uh, again, you just um, got right into it. Like you didn't have a lot of um, preface. Like you didn't have to be like, I'm queer, I'm a lesbian, I have a girlfriend. You just, you just got right into it. And then you, you, the audience has to do the work to be like, this person defies my expectation of what, what a queer brown woman looks like. So I, I, I like that a lot. Um, it was, uh, I, I was, I was thinking about the, the, the pimple, like maybe, uh, when you want to flex that you are, you know, cultural, you'll just like eat a bunch of pizza or like not do your, uh, face exfoliation that day or yeah. something. So you can have, uh, bindis. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but I, I like the, um, I mean, I don't think you, I mean, maybe you could call, yeah, like a, a Pfizer five, uh, or a Moderna nine or something. You don't, I mean, you, you can, you can play Moderna with that a little nine, bit. Yeah. 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 Um, but, uh, I, I do, I, I want to know more about that because that's, that's a really good take on it because, you know, the, the hot people in our society now are going to be, uh, old people and pre-existing condition people and essential workers. So because they can you know go out and shop and they can be parts of things so i want i want to know more about um your attraction to these like ambulance people or, or whatever like would you leave your girlfriend for them or i think that's that's kind of interesting and what was the <laughs> joke about what was the joke about your girlfriend's hair it's long but oh yeah um that she she has beautiful hair but she sheds like a husky going through chemo Cause I, cause I thought, you know, like Huskies, they already shed a lot on their own. And then a Husky going through chemo, that's just hair all over. Like the God, like they just could, look like a Siamese cat. Yeah. Could you, could you say that she has a lot of hair instead of hair down to her? Cause one, Ooh. one is length and one is, um, amount. And so yeah. Husky makes me think of amount, but length makes me think of a different kind of joke. Oh yeah. 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 Hell yeah. You're so funny, Sereni. You're very I'm high. so glad that we had so many brown people and so many women yeah, uh, yeah. going up. Hell yeah. Yeah, the Husky Husky and Chemo, it was great. I, I liked it. I was I was like in my head, I was thinking, I was like, would that even work even better as like a three? Like a husky in the spring and chemo. But I I I don't I don't know if that's gonna kill it, you know? Yeah, so, uh, I was thinking like it, maybe it might be better to be like she sheds like a husky and you know give it a second and then be like oh my yeah, god like a husky chemo. going through chemo like let me really bring it yeah. home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. Love that. So good. One more time for Serenity, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're gonna do a short Q and A. If anybody has any questions for Daya, uh, let us know. You can either uh, say them out loud. You can put them in the chat. We'll take a few questions and then we'll call it quits. Anyone have any questions? Yeah. We're taking questions. Oh. Yeah. Can we just jump in? Yeah. 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 Um, sure. Awesome. When it comes to creativity and sort of generating new ideas, playing with new jokes, in addition to just looking, you know, from your life, do you guys have any games that you play or any sort of prompts that you use? Like I've done thought bubbles, but I'm looking for more. <laughs> um you know, in, in terms of a kind of like a, a visual structure of how to map out jokes just to just to get you know the juices flowing when you're trying to break yourself out of your rhythm of just like writing and rewriting the same stuff like when you want to generate content or do you have any sort of creative games that you play or um maybe this sounds too larry david but i try mm. to put myself in strange situations so i can i can um i can reflect on i mean not dangerous or anything like that but um mm. I um, accidentally had six boxes of Girl Scout cookies delivered to my dentist's office while I was having a teeth cleaning. 
And uh, <laughs> and I was like, oh, this is funny. I, I don't know how this happened, but it just happened that day. And they, they got mad at me. They, they gave me like a talking to. They were like, oh, do you consume this much sugar? And then I made up a story. I was like, no, no, no. I, I, I give the boxes away. And I was scared that they were going to like send like a, a, a dental social worker after me to monitor my dietary habits. So uh, that actually happened. Mm -hmm. So I try to kind of live a life in which I'm putting myself in in different situations and talking to different people or having uh, odd experiences. So and that informs my, because if I just sit down and try to mine my life, it, it feels very stale to me. So I'm, I'm kind of a more kinesthetic learner. I like to go out and do things and have things happen to me. Kinesthetic, everybody, look it up if you don't know what it means. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks, Lindsay. Any uh, any more questions? There was one question, Sammy, in the chat. Maybe you want to, um, because you created this thing. Um, uh, there are two questions. Nick said, so what is smart comedy versus regular comedy? Is it just book smart stuff? And then Vishal asked, how do you all feel about taking breaks in comedy for longer than a day? So those were in the chat previously, if you want to answer. Yeah, yeah. I feel like we, we discussed the, the, like, what is smart comedy? Like, different, okay. there's different kinds of intelligence. And smart comedy is just a kind of comedy that plays to that specific kind of intelligence. But obviously, a lot of people are going to consider smart comedy more of the book smart comedy, which is why people think that I'm a smart comic, <laughs> because it's all book shit. Mm -hmm. um, that said about the breaks, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I once did a comedy a thousand days in a row and I took a 10 day break um, and it felt amazing. And uh, the last 300, it was really the last 100 days, but the last 200 to 300 days, I was hitting a wall. I couldn't really write material in the last 200 days of my thousand days because I was so stuck in this like tunnel vision of just get up, perform, get up, perform, get up, perform, mm -hmm. that I couldn't, like Daya was saying earlier, I couldn't live a life. So mm -hmm. when I took that 10 days off, I came back to life and instantly just started writing again. So, um, so breaks are very important, very, very important. So in terms of how often you need to take them, that's up to you. But, you, you know, some people, I, I know comedians who can, you know, be off stage for two weeks and then get on stage and just be hilarious. Um, and then there's comedians like me who, if I don't get up like on a regular basis, I fumble my words. I don't know what I'm talking about. So I, I need to get up somewhat regularly just to have my voice warmed up, but some people might not need that. So you kind of got to figure out what camp you're in, but either way, if you're in your early stages of comedy, you, you should try to get on stage as much as possible because that's really gonna, we're gonna get the reps in. Um, but really, really relax into those breaks and just take them for what they're worth. They're very valuable. Those breaks are very important for you to live life. And just because you're taking a break from being on stage doesn't mean you're taking a break from everything else. Like Daya said earlier, you're writing all the time, you know, mm -hmm. and, and life is where, you're do, where you can do some of the, the greatest writing you'll ever do. So. Take those breaks. Sorry, I was swatting at a, like a fly or something. <laughs> take those breaks. <laughs> take th those breaks, everybody. Come I thought on. that was like, you know, you being like the coach. You're like, take those breaks, kid. Get out there and take those breaks. <laughs> um, there's a question. How do you write for specific corporate or science gigs? And someone else said, as a follow-up, is that a thing you tend to pick up on in the moment or adjust to, like the, the cruise ship thing? Um, mm. Yeah, Daya, what do you want to say about those? Um, so, so someone said smart crowd work and how do you approach it? And then, so smart crowd work, how do you write for corporate gigs? And then, um, uh, Michael, I don't quite understand the question. I'm on this cruise ship gig. I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. So maybe you could, um, clarify that. So, um, in terms of writing for corporate, um, uh, early on, I, I felt like nobody understood me because I was writing distinctly different sets. Like I'd write a set for the South Asian population. South Asians are the wealthiest demo in America, uh, surpassing you know Jewish people. So they have money, but their idea of humor is a little bit different than what would be at a, a club on a Friday night. So I was writing for corporate. I was writing for um, 
these Indian gigs. I was writing for open mics. I was writing things that I thought was exciting. And it's, um, it's difficult because you, at any given time, you have multiple different sets. And that's why it's such a mythology and such, such, a, such a fallacy when someone like Jerry Seinfeld says funny is funny because maybe mm -hmm. Jerry Seinfeld um, can perform, you know, in the places he's performing. But if he's at Showtime at the Apollo or Def Jam, he's going to bomb. Whereas Chris Rock can perform in all those rooms that Jerry does and he can do black rooms. So for people of color, for women, we have to do more. And that's unfair, but that's... That I mean, that's why I have the work ethic I do is because I have to constantly come up with new things. So the way you specifically write for corporate, sometimes it's clean, sometimes it's, um, you know, nerdy, sometimes it's uh, what do they do and make fun of what they do. Um, same thing with the cruise ship. Most of the time they want to know about their experience on the cruise or what they're seeing or at the buffet or you know their life they they want everyone just wants to feel like you understand them and you're giving them what they want i mean it's just like a conversation or just like meeting someone at a dinner party straight up i got a question I can jump in. yes uh how do you guys do you guys ever feel that paralysis when you're writing sometimes of like you know i have to write a joke that like fits all these parameters like it has to be like smart or it has to be dumb or it has to be personal or universal or it has to be all these things then you kind of just get that like paralysis that prevents you from actually writing anything because you're just searching for you know a bit that fits yep. all these perfect criteria my How do you solution over that? my solution to that is is uh smoke some weed then you'll be actually paralyzed and uh suddenly your mind turns on i mean i'm joking but at the same time that's actually like it's the easy it's it's an easy way out if you smoke weed it's an easy way out that i would take a lot and like i actually uh i i would smoke weed a lot until this is the first time I, i've been like sober for like three months and like since i don't know since high school maybe so uh i i would actually use weed to write but i think weed is not it's not something that you know, I'm saying like you should use weed to write, but like use something that weed did for me, which was weed would inspire me because I started smoking weed when I was 13 years old. So it would always kind of like inspire this like uh, different mindset in me. It was like I have a different personality when I'm on weed, but like weed, it can be something else for you. It can be like, you know, having a cup of coffee or it can be like going on a jog, then coming back with those endorphins. Do something to mix it up. When you try to sit there and write, you will feel, I mean, not will, but you often might feel that writer paralysis. When you try to force yourself, go out and do something. One of the things that I love to do, or at least I used to love to do, I would get high and I would go for walks and I would bring a little pad and pen with me. And it allowed me to break out of the work mindset and just be like, I'm having fun. I'm, I can spread my wings here and just think of whatever I want. And then writing becomes fun. It doesn't become something you're forcing yourself to do. So, you know, I, I, I know, like you said, it sounds like you're trying to like fulfill all these checklists, get out of that box and get in the mindset where you're inspired to just think like yourself and then write those things down and find out what's funny because you, you, you may think of something and it's not funny and you got to find out. And then once you do that more and you get more in the mind's eye, you have in your mind's eye, like what a crowd is, then like your thoughts with higher frequency become funnier. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. um, Michael, thanks for clarifying. Uh, Michael asks, do you feel that crowds that reject smart comedy are rejecting yeah. due to temporary circumstances like being drunk or sunburnt or whatever? Um, you know, I, I just think that there's people who like different things, just like any other art, just like food. And if they don't like what you have to offer, that's that's fine. You try to do something else. But um, what I find is sometimes you you have no control. Maybe um, something happened where the room is a little too hot or maybe something is occurring where um, the the service is a little slow and people are restless. Or, or maybe the show started late and they're taking it out on you. Like there's, 
there's no way to kind of control all of the variables that go into one single audience and how they're going to respond. So you are going to bomb. You're going to bomb even if you did the same joke in front of a similar crowd at the same club, but then it just falls apart and you don't know why. Um, I had an experience where Proops changed the date and so because he was going to be in um, Montreal or something. So he said, hey, Daya, can you do these additional dates at a different time? And he switched with a different headliner. So Friday Late Show, I had no idea what was happening because Proops' crowd is really smart. They understand my references. I just wasn't doing well. And I sort of, you know, turned on the crowd. I made fun of them. I told them that they were stupid. I enjoyed it. Um, and then afterwards, I apologized to Proops. I said, I'm so sorry. That was your crowd. I shouldn't have turned on them. I shouldn't have done that. And, he, and Proops goes, oh, I don't care. You're my friend. They're a bunch of idiots. And then he booked me again. So sometimes you're going to bomb and and uh, and it's because the audience is just not the right fit. And then you'll you'll figure it out the next time. But it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. People bomb all the time. It's not it's not the end of the world. Uh, I would like to differ that it is the end of the world. If you bomb, that's the universe trying to tell you something. And every every bomb is a chance for you to quit and do what the universe wants. <laughs> so those of us who don't give up, we're going against the universe. And that's how you become a great comedian, because the universe is about sharing and love and everything. And being a comedian requires an ego that would go against the universe. So... Keep bombing, everybody. Keep bombing. All right. Uh, I think that I think that's it. I think uh, I think we got it in there. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, and uh, let's give one more hand for our guest, Daya Lakshmi Narayanan. Thank you. Thank you for Woo! joining. And where can people find you, Daya? Um, DayaComedy.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Daya Live. Speaking of breaks, I'm going to take a break. Uh, my parents are both vaccinated. I haven't hugged and kissed them in over a year, so I'm going to see them soon. And I'm really happy about not doing comedy for a while, while I get to be with my parents. This was your last gig? <laughs> for a while, until maybe April. Hell yeah, everybody. Thanks. Uh, so thank you, Daya, for closing it out with us. And uh, once again, thanks for joining, everybody. We'll be doing more podcasts like these. If you enjoyed it, let us know. We always love feedback, and we love to hear uh, if you have any requests for topics for future episodes. So thank you one more time for coming. And, thank uh, you, Sammy, on Netflix. Thank you, and thank you for being one of my first writing partners. You're, I, I remember you fondly. <laughs> Drink to that, everybody. Take other people's ideas. They're worth their weight in gold. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for Bye. joining. Have a great night to chat if you want. We can hang out for a few minutes. You know how it is. Woo!